This Tuesday, the Chilean Senate delayed a vote on a long-awaited bill to legalize same-sex marriage and shelved another to decriminalize abortion. Some 200 personalities and politicians from 19 countries are participating in the seventh meeting of the Puebla Group, which began on Monday in Mexico. Ethiopians living abroad have mobilized to demand an end to foreign interference in the country as the war against the Tigray People's Liberation Front continues. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm Katrina Goss. This Tuesday, the Chilean Senate downplay delayed a vote on a long-awaited bill to legalize same-sex marriage and shelved another to decriminalize abortion. After passing through the Chamber of Deputies earlier this month, a vote was scheduled for Tuesday in the Upper House for the final green light, depending on approval from its Constitutional Commission. In a frustrating day for activists, the bill on gay marriage, which would also allow same-sex couples to adopt children, was sent back to legislators to iron out disagreements on the day many had hoped that it would finally be passed. In a separate process, a bill that would allow voluntary abortion within 14 weeks of pregnancy was put on hold pending a further reworking of the text, effectively archiving it for a year. We are frankly disappointed in what happened today in the Constitutional Committee in the Senate, since we hoped that the bill that was dispatched from the lower house could pass directly to the chamber without observations. However, it was decided to pass it to a mixed commission, which will delay it at least two or three weeks. We have waited so many years now. We have been on the first demonstration since the year 2000, in 2012 also, to ask for equal marriage. So I believe that there is a discouragement, but at the same time we have hope. We have hope because we have the society support, because it is a desire of the LGBTQI plus community. I believe that from today, if this law is approved, everything will change for same-sex couples, people who make up families with other people of the same sex, gays, lesbians, will have the same status as heterosexual people. That culturally is going to be very, very important for the country. In Honduras, the vote count following Sunday's general elections is progressing. With just over 52% of the ballots counted, presidential candidate Xiomara Castro of the Liberty and Refoundation Party continues to be set to become the country's first woman president, having secured more than 53% of the vote. Meanwhile, the right-wing candidate of the ruling National Party, Nasri Asfura, is in second place with almost 34% of the vote, according to the latest update by the National Electoral Council. In Peru, President Pedro Castillo denied having met with businessmen at his home to illegally favor them with concessions for public works and distance himself from any act of corruption while calling for an investigation into the accusations. They have tried to associate me with disgraced and corrupt politicians of yesteryear and to stain my honor and my reputation. They have tried to link the government of the people with acts of corruption. In the face of this, I firmly condemn and reject any act of corruption. Therefore, any person who betrays my trust and takes advantage of his or her position must be investigated and punished by the justice system. The Peruvian president also declared a state of emergency in several northern regions of the country affected by a recent earthquake and instructed the authorities to attend to the affected population. In these critical moments that we are living, and that our brothers in the northeastern regions are living, my government is focused on assisting the affected population. Therefore, I announce to the country that I have ordered the declaration of emergency in the regions of Amazonas, Cajamarca, Loreto, and San Martin. From the first moment, I have personally directed the actions on the field because I guarantee that we will not rest until all the affected population recovers the worthy living conditions that all Peruvians deserve. Celebrations continue in Barbados as the Caribbean island became the world's newest republic this Tuesday and rid itself of the colonial legacy of the British monarchy. 
On Tuesday, the new members of the Cabinet were sworn in during a ceremony at the Heroes Square in Bridgetown. The oath of office was conducted by the Caribbean nation's first president, Sandra Mason, who was inaugurated in the early hours of Tuesday. The move comes as Barbados celebrates the 55th anniversary of its independence from Britain, a celebration with even more meaning as it throws off the shackles of colonialism on removing Queen Elizabeth II as its head of state after almost 400 years of British rule. And during her speech as part of the celebrations of Barbados' independence and transition to a parliamentary republic, Prime Minister Mia Motley stated that every citizen is conscious of the responsibility they have as of December 1st. We too are conscious, all of us, that we are in a process of transition, that the journey has started and continues at a new level. 396 years of a system of government is not two years. And it is with that in mind that I am conscious that we have a responsibility as of December 1st, tomorrow, to ensure that our nation moves as one. The Prime Minister of Barbados also thanked her counterparts from the Caribbean region who joined the nation in its independence celebrations. I want to thank my brothers and sisters of the Caribbean region who have joined us today. This means more than you will ever know. And it is because our people in this very difficult and turbulent times must always remember that we don't walk this earth alone and that we have committed, whether it was in the failed attempt of the West Indies Federation or whether it is in the current incarnation of CARICOM that we have committed that we will always treat each other better than we treat anyone else because we are one family with one destiny. And we'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Some 200 personalities and politicians from 19 countries arrived in Mexico to participate in the seventh meeting of the Pueblo Group, which began on Monday. The meeting is the first of the group to be held face-to-face -face since 2020 when its members began to meet virtually due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Members of the group have issued new proposals for what they call a model of solidarity and development in the American continent. The electoral process in Chile and Honduras, the future elections in Brazil, as well as the situation in Venezuela and Cuba are among the current affairs addressed at the meeting. Presidents, former presidents, ministers, parliamentarians, jurists, academics and observers are participating in the event which runs until Wednesday and takes place in parallel to the announcement of the first election results in Honduras and in the lead up to the second round presidential vote in Chile. When addressing the Pueblo Group meeting, former President of Brazil, Luis Inácio Lula Silva, called for an analysis of the steps to be taken to protect the most vulnerable sectors of society in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. This third meeting of the Pueblo Group is taking place at a time when there is a concern in the world. What will humanity's future be like after the pandemic? Likewise, what is the future of humanity now during the pandemic? What can we do for the poorest, most humble people? What can we do for workers who have lost their jobs? Or what can we do for the millions and millions of, be of beings who, all over the world, travel along roads, railways, and oceans looking for an opportunity to work, to eat, to live, and do not find shelter, do not find solidarity? Often, many times, they are marginalized. Meanwhile, Argentine President Alberto Fernandez called on the Prevola Group to promote development in Latin America and the Caribbean in order to reduce inequalities in the region. It is imperative that we recover the path of development. We live in this continent, our Latin America, which is the most unequal in the world, the continent with the greatest gap between the rich and the poor. If once and for all we do not take the bull by the horns, truth be told, once again we will be struck by that dreadful reality that the pandemic has exposed the reality of inequality in which a few enjoy life and millions and millions suffer. 
Likewise, Bolivian President Luis Arce stressed that it's time to discuss concrete action in order to face the resurgence of COVID-19. It is important that all the leaders of our peoples of Latin America gathered in the Puebla group take another look at the health issue, at what is happening with the pandemic, the resurgence of the pandemic in several countries where quite drastic measures are being taken. We should also call our attention so that we take joint measures to protect ourselves and take care of ourselves. To all member countries in the region, we think that it is the right time to bring these issues back to the discussion table so that all countries can coordinate joint actions because it is clear from what we are seeing that the efforts we have seen in many Latin American countries to increase vaccination, to solve the health issue, are unfortunately being exposed to risks that come from the poor distribution of vaccines worldwide. On Tuesday, the United States revoked its designation of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia People's Army as a foreign terrorist organization. The U.S. government had indicated its intention to remove the former guerrilla group from its terror listing on November 23rd, the eve of the fifth anniversary of the peace deal between the Colombian government and the FARC, which led to their disarmament as the group dissolved after decades of fighting. The revolutionary organization, which fought for five decades for a more equal Colombia, transformed into a political party in the wake of the peace agreement, with a guaranteed representation in Colombia's legislature. Observers had increasingly warned that failure to lift the U.S. designation would restrict their ability to support programs involving former FARC fighters, including removing landmines and replacing illegal crops. In Bolivia, a commission of prosecutors issued an accusation against Janine Agnes for alleged crimes committed as senator and up until her self-proclamation as president of the country following the 2019 coup against Eva Morales. There are sufficient elements to show that Mrs. Janine An- There are sufficient elements to show that Mrs. Janine Anya's Chavez acted contrary to the law while being a senator, so her conduct adapts to criminal offenses foreseen in Article 153, referring to resolutions contrary to the Constitution and laws, and also Article 154 in relation to the breach of duties. The cases of Coup 1 and Coup 2 have to do with the actions of attributed to Mrs. Janine Añez before she was self-proclaimed president of the state. In that sense, they are prior to her being able to use the presidential sash. In Spain, civil servants and public workers in Catalonia called a 24-hour strike to reject the excess of temporary jobs and the decree approved by the government to regularize the situation. Catalan civil servants were called to support the strike action to demand that workers who've been in their posts for more than three years are offered permanent posts. Unions also called for a week of mobilizations. A similar strike by temporary public sector workers was held on October 28th with the same motive, which according to the unions was supported by 18% of interim employees. Sweden's first woman Prime Minister, Magdalena Andersson, on Tuesday presented her one-party centre-left minority government with only a few changes compared to the previous cabinet. Andersson described the new cabinet as a good balance between experience and the renewed efforts that are needed and promised to work hard on improving working conditions and social security. The leader of the Social Democratic Party was elected Prime Minister again on Monday after resigning last week, just hours into the job when the parliamentary defeat of her budget prompted her then-coalition partner, the Greens Party, to quit the two-party coalition. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Ethiopians living in South Africa marched to protest the United States and European Union interference in their home country as the conflict between the government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front continues. Our collaborator, Kaleva Banganali, brings us the details. The protesters who traveled from Johannesburg to Pretoria in buses and taxis arrived in Pretoria in high spirits and crisscrossed the streets of Pretoria where they handed over a memorandum to the United States Embassy before traveling another five kilometers to the EU Embassy to hand over another memorandum of demands. The march was part of efforts to show disdain at the Western interference in the affairs of Ethiopia 
especially their backing of the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Those acts of insurgency have escalated the human rights crisis in the country, including mass murders of women and children. <laughs> After handing over a memorandum of demands to the EU embassy, they sang as they assembled to listen to a message of solidarity from the youth of South Africa, and this is what their leader had to say. <laughs> I know our leaders are scared of talking because they are blinded. Yeah. We are not blinded. Yeah. And I'm going to say this yeah. Our leaders are scared of telling the rest of the world where to go. I will tell them you must go to hell. Yeah. The procession also served as a as disapproval against the ongoing and deliberate false reporting by some mainstream foreign media, including the CNN, BBC. Al Jazeera and others that have been exposed for supporting what is clearly an ongoing attempt to invade Ethiopia by imposing a regime which previously ruled the country with an iron fist and with scant regards for human rights for a whole country. <laughs> As they left the embassy, these protesters, they sang Ethiopian liberation songs and warned the EU and the USA to stay away from Ethiopia and stop supporting the TPLF. For Telesur English, I'm Clever Banganai reporting live from Pretoria, South Africa. <laughs>
Vaccination is progressing in the world, but Africa suffers from an immunity gap with an immunization rate below the fifth of the world average. This is an extremely unfair and unreasonable situation, which we must immediately put an end to. The health and life of the African people are as precious and important as that of the other people in the world. China, a good friend of African countries, ready to make more efforts to bring more vaccines to Africa. The People's Republic of China has agreed that the Fakat agenda should be in line with the African Agenda 2063. We believe that the Dakar Conference will mark a turning point, a turning point in terms of form, a turning point in terms of innovative mechanisms that we will have, so that we will be able to better adjust our work and better monitor what we are doing together between China and Africa. And we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many of our stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And you can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.